uh, welcome. We'll take a break about halfway through. Uh, there are washrooms just around the corner, men's and women's, and we'll get started there too. Um, for those of you that have taken Oceanside School of the Bible classes in the past, we've been very interactive in the teaching. We're trying something different in this class. We're going to try to capture the video and the teaching on its own in the first three quarters of an hour. So I really want to hear your questions. I want to hear your input, but I just ask if you could just jot it down after the break. We'll have more time than we had last week to interact and to talk about the scriptures. And, um, but we just felt like this video thing that we're doing, it's, although it's still very much in its infancy, we're, we, we're believing that God wants to use it for other things. So if we can get a good capture uh, in that first little bit, we're going to do that. So your questions are important, but just save them until after the break and we'll get to them. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this little song that was just playing. It says, you're a good, good father. And Lord, we just thank you for your goodness and for your gifts. Settle our hearts, Lord, from a very busy day and all the things we've been through. Holy Spirit, we just want to hear from you. Thank you that you've promised to be our teacher and you are the best teacher ever. So Lord, I pray you teach us and show us new things in your word tonight. Jesus, glorify yourself as we go through this tonight. Your name, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit in Jesus' life. And uh, I thought this would be an easy night, but the more I started to study it, I realized, wow, this is actually, there's so much there. And when I thought about the Holy Spirit in Jesus' life, what could be more foundational than the Holy Spirit's role in his birth? So we'll start there tonight. If you want to turn to Matthew 1.18. I don't, I don't exactly know what to say about this. I, you know, I, for a guy who can say anything about anything, I'm still trying to figure out. I know it's important, but we'll get through here. But Matthew 1.18 says this. Now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you'll call his name Jesus and he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the, through the prophet, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Then Joseph woke from his sleep. He did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took his wife, but he did not know her until she had given birth, and they called his name Jesus. There's two accounts, of course, of Jesus' birth. Look over to the book of Luke. This is the one that Linus always reads in the Charlie Brown Christmas story. Luke 1.26 Luke 1.26 says, In the sixth month the, uh, of the month, angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee named Na Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man who was named Joseph of, Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you should call his name Jesus. He will be called Great, the Son of the Most High God, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, Mary had gone to grade five sex education class, okay, so she has a really great question to the angel. I mean, let's just be really honest here, okay? She says, how can this be since I'm a virgin? The angel said, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born. We call holy the Son of God. He talks about Elizabeth and what some of the things that Elizabeth was doing. And so we see that, that initial, if you want to call it, conception of Jesus is from the Holy Spirit. Now, this is hard for us to get our head around. And like I said, I thought it was going to be easy to say something about it. I just want to, to us to note that it starts 
right from the very beginning, the Holy Spirit's ministry, if you want to call that, in Jesus' life. As a church, we believe in the historical doctrine called the virgin birth. Now, you may have heard this. Amazingly, lots and lots of churches nowadays are drifting away from this doctrine of the virgin birth like it's not important. It still really matters to us. So why is this, this understanding of the virgin birth such a big deal? Why do we take these two passages literally and say, actually, this is what happened? Why is that so important to us? Well, um, a couple things fit in there, but a close look at Jesus' genealogy reveals something very unique. There's two genealogies of Jesus, and the first one is back in Matthew 1. Let's go back there. And I'm just going to pick out verse 16 because I don't want to read all the sons of sons. Matthew 1, 16. Uh, in Matthew's version, it starts way back with Abraham and he works his way down to Jesus. But in verse 16, he says, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. So it's very interesting that Jesus' genealogy, if you look carefully, doesn't say the, the son of Joseph. It says the, the wife of Joseph is Mary and Jesus was her son. Look over in Luke 3.23. Same thing comes up again. Luke goes the other way. He starts with Jesus and goes from there up in the family tree. But same kind of thing. Luke 3.23 says this. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of, son of, son of, son of. So he says, as, as, as supposed was the son. It's interesting that the Pharisees, if you look carefully, they dug up the muck on Jesus. They were the king of the muckrakers. And they, at one point in their anger, they said, we don't even know whose son you are. You're, you're an illegitimate child. They, they accused Jesus of being a bastard uh, in the true sense of that word, in the height of the thing. So there's this cloud over Jesus right from the very beginning. You know, it's something we kind of understand now if you don't know who your dad is. It's hard, but, but it, in this time, in Jesus' time, to, to be an illegitimate birth, oh man, I mean, you don't qualify for anything, let alone being a religious teacher. So he has this cloud over his, his birth. But it's very interesting that the genealogies don't show the connection between he and his earthly father. Now, now let me just take a little sidetrack and I'll, we'll come back to that. Jesus was called the second Adam in Scripture, or the last Adam. Look with me at Romans 5.12. Why does this matter? Romans 5.12. This is a good kind of understanding of what Jesus did. we we'll look look uh, 5.12 to 21. Those of you guys that were in the Romans class will remember this because this was a pretty significant passage. But uh, 5.12 to 21. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, he's referring to Adam, great, 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 great grandpa Adam, through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all have sinned. For sin was indeed in the world before the law was given, but sin was not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses even though those who were sinning by not, who were not sinning like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Uh, verse 15, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, talking of Adam, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. So you see he's comparing this first Adam and this second Adam. Um, where am I? 16, and the free gift is not like the result of one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass bought condemnation, thank you Adam, but the free gift following many trespasses bought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through that one man, Jesus Christ. So there's this comparison between these two Adams, the first Adam and Jesus Christ. First Adam brought wreckage, Jesus brings rescue, if you want to look at it that way. Um, because see, in the garden, if you remember back to the very beginning in, in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve had free choice. God said, don't eat of this tree, but he didn't put a big fence around it. He didn't, you know, there weren't like crocodiles in a moat. He just said, this is what I'm telling you, don't do that. And they had the choice to be obedient or not be obedient. But as soon as they made the choice for disobedience, it changed everything for all the rest of humanity. 
they chose rebellion and they passed down a horrible legacy to all the rest of their kids, including us who are sitting in this room. Their children would be destined to sin. There was no choice in the matter. Adam and Eve could choose to, to sin or not sin, but because of the choice they made, everybody else is destined to sin. Now that rocks our world. We, we don't like anybody telling us that we're destined to do anything. But the Bible is very clear about that. We have no choice in the matter. Apart from a direct intervention of God, that's all we can do is sin. This doctrine is called original sin. You may have heard of the doctrine of original sin. That basically we're hooped. We come out of the womb ready to sin and planning on it. Okay? That's called the doctrine of original sin. So now let's loop back to Jesus and think about the reality that if all of humanity, everybody who had a dad, got infected with original sin and could not make a choice for God, how different would it be that Jesus didn't have an earthly father? You see where I'm going here? Jesus was not conceived by a human father, but he had the choice to obey God or not. Like the first Adam's original situation. Jesus could choose not to sin. He didn't inherit that thing which you and I have, which were hooped, called original sin. He didn't get that. That's why those genealogies are so specific about who Jesus was. And that's why there was this cloud over his whole life of being an illegitimate child. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So he didn't have that issue of being stuck and having to sin. He got the choice. Now here's the scripture that rocks the world. Look at Hebrews 4.15. Some of you guys that were in the Hebrews class, I remember when we went through this, we all went, oh, we thought through some of the implications of this scripture, but Hebrews 4.15. He's talking about the high priest, Jesus, in this chapter. In verse 14, uh, Hebrews 4, he says, Since we have such a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let's hold fast to our confession. Here's the kicker. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus was tempted in every way and yet chose not to sin. Now just think that through a little bit. Adultery, you know, fornication, homosexuality, run that one through your little grid. Jesus was tempted in every way. And you can bet the, the devil would have pulled out every card he had in the deck to get Jesus to rip up. So Jesus was tempted in every way, and yet Jesus did not sin. He chose obedience. Now just hang on, one more piece, this thing about the God-man, the mystery of what's called the incarnation. God takes on flesh. This is the hard part. That's, there's a lot for us that's hard to understand about who Jesus is and was, but God took on flesh, the God-man. Philippians 2, 5, and 8. How does this all look? Let's just read that. This will, if, you're, if you're getting fuzzy, hang on, we're getting there. We're, we're going we're gonna to loop this all together in a minute. But I want you to see these pieces and just hang on to them. Philippians 2, 5 and 8. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Go eat popcorn. Uh, Philippians 2, 5 to 8. So this is speaking of Jesus, and he says... Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Speaking of Jesus, whom though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed him on the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord of, God, of glory the God of, and God of the Father. It's very hard to understand this dual nature of Jesus, because Jesus is God, he was God, and yet he came to earth and went through a womb and was a baby and had pampers and everything else that was required to grow up as a, as a human child. So this is the incarnation, God taking on flesh. And people have been trying to figure this out for 2,000 years, but my little teeny brain, the best I can do is to say this scripture says he emptied by taking. Okay, He emptied himself of the divine thing by taking on the human thing. This is really hard to understand. Here's a visual for you. Take like a coat. I think Jesus took off his God coat 
and set it aside while he was here on earth, okay? To, to take the form of a man. Doesn't mean he wasn't God. Doesn't mean he stopped being God. But he set aside his glory while he was on earth to become a human being. Now remember one time in Jesus' life when he put the coat back on? The Mount of Transfiguration. Remember, he took a couple of his key guys up on the mountain and for a moment he put the God coat back on with the glory and the shining and they were all freaking out. Peter's like, let's just build houses here and retire because this is so God stuff, you know? And Jesus takes the coat back off and goes down the mountain and says, don't tell anybody about this right now. So you see him kind of putting that glory, that God part back on, but he chose not to do that, all right? He chose to be in human flesh. Now, where's all this going? Here's where it's going. So much of my life, I looked at Jesus and just figured he was on cruise control in life in terms of obedience. He's God. Of course he knows everything. Of course he's not going to sin. Of course he's you know, going to walk on. Well, he's just God, you know? That's true, he is God, but I don't think now that Jesus was on cruise control in his life. I think it was possible that he had the option to choose, but he didn't. I don't believe Jesus was able to live a sinless life because he chose, I said, oh, I don't believe, I do believe, get this right. I do believe that Jesus, you're going to throw me out. I do believe that Jesus was able to live a sinless life because he chose to depend completely on the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in his life. I don't think Jesus lived a sinless life because he was God. I think he lived a sinless life because he depended fully on the Holy Spirit. Now that's a new thing for me in, a, in, a number, in the last number of years because I just thought he was cruise control. But when you see the reality of this thing and all the stuff that the devil was throwing at him and the way he related to the Holy Spirit, it starts to make sense. So let's go into some of those things. Let me show you some of the things, some examples of how Jesus was depending on the Holy Spirit and how he was relating to the Holy Spirit in his life on earth. Um, he waited to start his public ministry until probably 30. Uh, he waited until the Holy Spirit descended on him. I mean, when you think about it, he probably died at 33. Does that make a whole lot of sense to you? It's been 30 years, maybe looking after your mom, being a carpenter, and then you, the last three years you would like change the world? <laughs> the math doesn't add up to me. And yet, Jesus had an amazing sense of timing in his life. Have you noticed that when you read, his, read the, in the Gospels? And his time had not yet come. They want to take him king. He goes out in the desert. His brothers say, show yourself. Be the big man. It's not right now. You don't know. You know, any time's good for you. There's a sense of pacing and the sense of, of timing in Jesus' life in terms of how he revealed who he was. So he waits till he's 33. Let's look at his baptism in Matthew 3, 13 to 17. Jesus' baptism shows up in all four of the Gospels. There's not too many things that show up in all four. Matthew 3, 13 to 17 is where we're going. Um, there's not too many things that show up in all the Gospels. A lot of things are in the first three, and then, of course, John's Gospel is later. He's, he's not repeating. He's bringing some other things up. But Jesus' Gospel, just interesting, is in the three. It's in Matthew 3, it's in Mark 1, it's in Luke 3, and it's in John 1. But let's look at uh, Matthew 3 for tonight. Matthew 3, 13 to 17. Now, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan River to John. This is John the Baptizer, or John the Baptist to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him by saying, I need to be baptized by you. Why do you come to me? I mean, that's a great observation for John. Like, I know who you are. You're the Lamb of God. You know, you're, I'm not baptizing you. You need to baptize me. Jesus says, let it be so now for this fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, whom I'm well pleased. So this is the, the water baptism and the Holy Spirit showing up, descending on Jesus at roughly age 30. One of the things that's pretty cool, just I couldn't resist it from last week, go back to Isaiah 42.1. You know what? I think that I, it's dawned on me that I never am really going to understand and the New Testament until I start to understand the Old Testament. There is so much in the Old Testament that lets us understand what was going on in the New Testament. And we start to see the prophetic words and the things that were spoken hundreds of years before sometimes they took place. It really builds your faith and encourages you. But just wanted to give you one. Isaiah 42.1, maybe, I don't know, 300 years, I'm just guessing, before Jesus was born. 42.1, he says, Behold my servant who I will uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights... 
that sound like what God said from heaven? I have put my spirit on him and he will bring forth justice to nations. Goes to talk more about Jesus' life. But I just love that 300 years before, Isaiah is prophesying about this event that he, he probably didn't even understand. Like, what's this? Well, I don't know what this is all about. 300 years later, it looks awful lot like Jesus' baptism, but there's just a lot like that, but it's, it's just wonderful to see. But, so there's Jesus' baptism. That's the Holy Spirit coming and resting on him. And then from there, he starts his public ministry. So now you'd think from there in his baptism, the first thing he would do would be to go into the nations and the crowds and announce who he is and start healing people, doing kinds of stuff. Not what happens. The very next thing is he goes into the temptation of Jesus. And this shows up in three places, Matthew 4, Mark 1, and Luke 4. Let's look at the Luke one. Luke 4, 1 to 15. So Jesus is, is baptized. He comes up. The Holy Spirit comes on him. And in Luke 4, 1, and Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, this is what I want you to start to see some of this language. Here's Jesus, God himself, being described as being full of the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan River and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. For 40 days being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. That's an understatement. We always think the Holy Spirit's leading us to wonderful ease and, and incredible, I mentioned it on Sunday morning, you know, wealth and health and all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah, God blesses us. But the Holy Spirit is not so much interested in our comfort. He's interested in our character, in our growth. And here's the Holy Spirit leading Jesus into the desert in a place with no food to get ready for this onslaught. The devil was going to throw everything he could to try to get him to trip, trip him up. And yet it's the Holy Spirit leading. And it's Jesus responding to the Holy Spirit. I, you know, I can't wait to ask Jesus, you know, what, how, how did that seem to you? Did that seem counterintuitive? that you should go off to the desert and not eat anything for 40 days to get ready for this big test. Yet he was obedient to the Holy Spirit's lady that said, go out in the, in the, in the desert. We won't take the time to go through the whole um, temptation. It's a whole other preach, but Jesus is just consistently depending on God for the scripture of God. One of the things that's wonderful about the Holy Spirit, we'll see it in a couple weeks, is it says that he brings to our minds the things we need to say when we don't know what to say. Like when Satan's in your face tempting you. You know, I just think this is the Holy Spirit bringing to mind scriptures to Jesus. Yeah, sure, Jesus has studied the scriptures. Yes, he was God, but I think he was depending on the Holy Spirit. Satan would say something, and Jesus, like, and the word says. Satan would say, and the word says, and the word says, you know, depart from me. Um, and then uh, that when the devil had ended his temptation, he departed until a more opportune time. So it was just round one. But in verse 14, look again. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And report about him went through all the surrounding country and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified uh, by all. So I just see this amazing leadership of the Holy Spirit and this responding of Jesus to the Holy Spirit in this first part of his public ministry. Let me show you a few others. The power source, I think we see behind Jesus' miracles. Look in Matthew 12, 28. We know his kind of arch enemies were the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious elite of Judaism at that time. And they were always riding him. How, who gives you this right? What authority do you have? They're always asking these kinds of questions. In Matthew 12, 28, it's a good illustration. He's just cast out a demon. And in Matthew 12, 28, uh, maybe I should go back a little bit more. Let's see. The, and the Pharisees had said, okay, we know how you're doing that. You're doing that by Satan. That's how you're casting the demons out. You're in, you're in, in league with Satan. They call it Beelzebub. And, and Jesus says, if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Duh. If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. <laughs> I think Jesus is just saying, it's the Holy Spirit in me, it's the Spirit of God in me enabling me to do this. You say it's the devil, you've made actually the complete opposite error. It's the Spirit of God, it's not the devil that's doing this. And you're, and you're missing that and he's you're warning them, don't miss this. Because this, if, if this is true, which it is, the kingdom of God is here. Look at Luke 4, 16. Luke 4, 16 to 21. 
And he came to Nazareth, speaking of Jesus, where he had been brought up. And it was his custom. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him and he unrolled the scroll to the place to where he found the place that it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Verse 20. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant. You can hear this silence. Whoa. And in the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. He began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. But look where it starts. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Isaiah, 300 years before, recognized the Spirit of the Lord was on him, on Isaiah, in speaking this in Isaiah's ministry, but it also had a prophetic picture for the one that was coming, the Messiah, who's Jesus. Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord on me that's going to let me do all this stuff, the things that I'm already doing, and the more things that I'm going to do. Look at Acts 1-2. This is just the introduction of Acts. Uh, but Luke says, In my first book, O Theophilus, I dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Verse 2. Until the day he was taken up, after he had been given commands, through the Holy Spirit, to the apostles from whom he had chosen. I'm just picking some to help you see the Holy Spirit's ministry in Jesus' life. The commands, the teachings were coming th through the Holy Spirit, through Jesus. Acts 10.38 Um, and now this is uh, looking back, Peter looking back at the ministry of Jesus, okay, is what's going on. And he says, uh, he's telling the story of Jesus in verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. And God was with him. And he goes on to talk about the things that Jesus was doing. So I just see so much evidence in terms of the fact that it's the Holy Spirit that's ministering through Jesus. He's being obedient to the Holy Spirit. He's allowing the Holy Spirit to flow through him. And that's something I had never seen before. It never even dawned on me that that might have been the mode that he was in. I just thought, like I said, he was God and he was, well, what else could he do, right? I think there was a choice. And I don't think the devil would have come at him if there was no choice. The devil's not stupid. You know, he tempted him in all these different ways. Let me give you a, a, a neat little Jesus mode of operation. You know, you know mode of operation, MO? I grew up with a, in a military family. My dad was in the Air Force. It was all about MO. He'd say, son, what's the MO there? Like if I didn't clean the car out right. What's the mode of operation, son? You know, I grew up with a dad like that, so I understand mode of operation. I'll give you a Jesus mode of operation, right? John 5, 19 to 20. <laughs> what was his mode of operation? John, don't try that with your spouse, by the way. John 5, 19 to 20. It doesn't work, I tried it. 5, 19 to, John 5, 19 to 20. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing on his own accord. Just let that settle in for a second. The Son can do nothing on his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. The Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And now just to blow our minds, and greater works than these <laughs> will he show you that you may marvel. So this is not particularly talking about the Holy Spirit, but I just want you to see Jesus modus and say, look, I'm actually not doing any of this stuff myself. I'm just watching God. I'm in touch with God. How many days on crazy days is Jesus off quietly, you know, just listening to God? Hey, what's up on the, today, on the daytime or today? You know, the the Disciples are running around trying to get, oh, we got a revival happening here and we're gonna, it's going to break out in the town. And Jesus says, well, you know, actually, let's go to some other town today. Where did he get that? He spent time with the Father. You know, the disciples had it all planned out. But it's like, God said, actually, no, you're done here. Go to another town. <laughs> you know, I, I don't do anything on my own, Jesus says. I just do what I see the Father doing. I, I, I listen to him and he leads me in that. I see Jesus in such a different way. Look at John 8, 28 and 29. John 8, this is toward the end of his ministry. So Jesus said to him, When you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing from my own authority. 
but speak just as the Father taught me. Uh, let's keep going. Let's do 29. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do these things that are pleasing to him. Um, so Jesus, this is his mode of operation. He's just listening to God. But I want you to see that the Holy Spirit, I think, is, is, is ministering through Jesus in this process. See, I think we, we shouldn't look at Jesus' sinless life as a cruel reminder that we'll never measure up. I mean, be honest. Have you ever felt like that? You're reading Jesus' life and you're going, he is so out there, up there, God there. I will never, ever be able to be like that. So why am I even reading this thing and trying? You know, I think we get that backwards. We shouldn't look at his sinless life as a cruel reminder that we'll never measure up, but as a shining example of what it looks like when a person chooses to depend completely in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life. I, I think I misunderstood Jesus' life for a lot of my life. I think he demonstrated what does it look like when you fully operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you fully listen to God, every moment you choose to be obedient. How does it turn out? I think it turns out looking like Jesus' life. I think that's the whole point why we have four different books in Jesus' life. Not so we go, oh, I'm such a worm, I'll never do that. But so we can say, wow, look at this. The Son of God, the, the God himself, chose to be obedient and to listen to the Holy Spirit and to follow the... Do you see it a little bit differently now? The ministry of the Holy Spirit in his life? Some people take this to the whole... Every, in church history, there's always an extreme. You come up with some truth and give it some time, somebody will mess it up. There's this thing called total sanctification. This, this thing that says, well, Jesus was perfect. I'm going to be like Jesus. And, and I've, you know, I've heard some people say, well, actually, I, I'm sinless now. You know, I'm like, <clears throat> where's your wife? You know, I mean, let me meet your wife. I'll, I'll verify your sinless status, you know. So I'm not saying we're going to become sinless. Don't hear me say that that's going to happen. Because in 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And then 2, it says, if we say we have no sin, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. We're deceiving ourselves. So I'm not saying, we're, you know, we're going to get to this place where we don't sin, right? But what I'm saying is, Jesus, I think, came on earth. One of the reasons, there are a lot of reasons Jesus came, obviously, to provide redemption and a lot of things, but he modeled, I think, for us, what does it look like just to walk with the Holy Spirit? Consistently, every decision, every thought, every temptation, every day, what does that look like? It looks like Jesus. And I, and I think he's saying, come, follow me. What did he say to the disciples? Follow me. They said, where are you going? Well, just hang out. Let's, let's walk. You know? Come and watch what I do and just do that. I think that was the amazing ministry of Jesus with those 12 goofballs that he spent three years with, you know, and, the, and some of the other ones, right? Just follow me. Just watch what I'm doing. So what's the take home? I think as we look at the Holy Spirit's ministry in Jesus' life, I think it just encourages me to have an increased dependency on the Holy Spirit in every area of our lives. I think it's just so amazing and we'll see so much more particularly next week when Jesus starts to lay out the job description of the Holy Spirit the coming new kind of ministry we're going to look at uh, Jesus promise of the Holy Spirit it's just one thing after another you it just blows our minds how amazing the Holy Spirit is but I think it's wonderful that we see that he operated in the Holy Spirit in his life and I think it gives me the message that it gives me hope not that I'm going to be perfect but you know what I'm not going to be stuck you know I'm not stuck I'm not defeated in Christ Yes, I blow it. Yes, I screw up. But I have the power of the Holy Spirit to walk in to say no to temptation as Jesus said no to temptation, even though he was God. I hope your mind's getting blown. I'm trying. <laughs> increased, increased dependency on the Holy Spirit in every area of our lives. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your model. <laughs> Not to discourage us, but to encourage us of how rich it is just to walk with the Holy Spirit and to walk with your Heavenly Father. Lord, I thank you that you invite us. You just say, hey, come, come follow me. Thank you, Father, for your love and for your goodness. Amen.